Hello. 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 Um, hello. Hey, we've got uh, Professor Stephen King, formerly from the University of Western Sydney, as of uh, a few months ago. Now he's uh, he's the world's most famous, or one of the world's most famous unemployed economists. Um, <laughs> you can read it online if you want to read where that uh, stems from. Uh, he's the author of uh, Debunking Economics, uh, and he's a world expert on Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. You've often been referred to in the media as uh, Dr. Doom, mm -hmm. the merchant of gloom, and he famously, if you'll recall, in 2009 lost a, uh, a bet. Allegedly to, lost a bet. A less, a debate, allegedly a lost the a bet. In terms of the contract. Right. To, uh, <laughs> to an interest rate uh, strategist from Macquarie, Rory Robertson, mm -hmm. and as a result, he had to walk from Parliament House mm -hmm. to... Mount Kosciuszko. Mount Kosciuszko. Yeah. He said it's okay for me to mention it, so <laughs> if you're wondering... Um, now, he's here to speak to us about monetary macroeconomics uh -huh. using Minsky, and I think it's fair to say that, uh, certainly for me, this will be quite a new topic. Um, certainly when I studied economics, uh, Minsky wasn't um, referred to um, in, uh, in substance. Uh -huh. um, so this will certainly be new to me, and I'm sure it'll be new to uh, many others who have gone through university in the last few years. Yeah. Well, well, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to come along and talking about, about Minsky the Man and Minsky the, the Program, which I've recently been developing courtesy of a grant from the uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking. And what I want to talk about to you is the, the, the trying to bring about a new approach to how we model the macroeconomy. Because you think about how we model it in current economic terms, that virtually, well, every model on the planet effectively is non-monetary. And often critics of economic theory blame neoclassical theory for that, but it's not just neoclassical theory that argue we could model the macroeconomy without including money. You can find the same thing in Keynes. He talks about how money, he saw money as essential, and you know, the book was called The General Theory of Interest, uh, Employment and, and Money. And he said it's essentially peculiar, but he says technical monetary both details fall into the background. And we can actually go back and do all our usual old stuff on supply and demand, the fundamental theory of value. So even with Keynes, you can find an argument that you don't need to include money or the way in which money is produced when you're looking at the macroeconomy. <clears throat> and he still saw that as being more general than the classical theory. And so modern dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models are continuing this trend which Keynes was also a part of to say you don't need to include money technically in how you model the economy. Now, the rationale when you ask a, a uh, a new Keynesian economist, why don't you include banks' debt and money in your models? Uh, the argument is normally that debt and money involve just redistributions between different people. And the classic here is, if you look at the, uh, the reason that uh, Bernanke gave for ignoring Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory of Great Depressions when he wrote his book, Essays on the Great Depression, or the papers that led to it, he said Fisher's idea was less influential because debt deflation is no more than a redistribution from one group to another. And absent huge differences in their consumption patterns, a pure redistribution should have no macroeconomic impact. And then this is Krugman talking more recently, his book End This Depression Now. He said if you ignore the foreign component, the debt you might owe to the rest of the world, uh, the overall level of debt makes no difference. One person's liability is another person's asset. But the two cancel each other out and you can ignore them. He said debt therefore only matters if there's a substantial difference in the nature of the constraints facing the people who are creditors and the people who are debtors. So otherwise you can ignore bank debt and you can certainly ignore banks. So Krugman's own model, uh, which he did with Eggleston, which tried to show why debt did matter in a liquidity trap, had debt in a non-monetary consumable item bond with no banks. So even when he took money into account or debt into account, it left out banks and money in so doing. Now I come from a perspective that says you have to have money in your models, and you have to have banks as well. And to justify that, let's take a look at the reasons used to say you don't need to worry about it. And that fundamentally says, if you look at a, 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 the accounting involved in, in a financial transaction, there'll be one person's asset is another person's liability. They balance out. And if you look at assets, we're equal to liabilities plus equity, and that's definitionally true. But what is money? Well, it's Graziani, a, a French theorist you may not have heard of, most people haven't, but I think you should definitely read his work. comes from a school called the Securitas School out of Europe, and they say that money is essentially a valueless token. If I take a piece of paper out of my pocket and give it to you, one of you, 
big enough amount of money, you'll give me your, your iPad. Okay? But it's with paper itself, you can't do anything with it except an exchange. Now, you accept it as a full transaction. If I give you, the, you know, six little pieces of yellow paper in Australia, you'll give me your, your, your iPhone. Maybe not your iPad, but your iPhone. But at the same time, the people who generate that, asset, that piece of paper or that notional valueless token can't get any rights of seniorage out of doing it. They can't go and print an extra six and go and buy the iPad off here. Okay? They have to earn it the same way the rest of us do. So Graziani said the only way you can fulfil all those conditions is to have the means of payment, that token, be promises to pay the third agent. And he said that these days is a bank. So when you have a transaction, somebody paying by means of a cheque or a bank tr or a transfer passes across a promise to pay from them to the person they're paying the money to. And he says that is the essence of money. So when you look at it in that sense, what money is, it's the liability of the banking sector to the rest of society. So you take a look from the point of view of banks now. If banks, you know, we, we use their liability, the deposit accounts we all have, uh, the, the liability of the banking sector to you. And when you make a transfer to me, particularly an FPOS is the most obvious case, if you swipe a card at a retailer, you're taking money out of your life set of li liabilities the bank has to you, your asset, their liability, and transferring that liability to another person. So if the banking sector expands its assets and its liabilities equally, it increases the amount of money in circulation, and it also adds to buying power. And that's the essence of the endogenous money approach that post Keynesians have been developing empirically for the last 50 years, ever since the work of a guy called Basil Moore. Now, that's very, very different to the way that new Keynesians think when they use what's called the loanable funds edition. If you've done an economics degree, which pretty much everybody in this room, anybody not done economics in this room? Go. Once, a couple of survivors, okay, a few. Uh, that's the, the supply and demand vision of loanable funds. Ignores that completely and simply says that you don't have an increase in the amount of debt in the economy. The economy as a whole doesn't borrow more. What's simply happening is less patient people borrow from more patient people. Now, this is out of an academic paper by Krugman, or I think out of his, his book, but part of his paper as well. And he said it's just a transfer from one person to another. So the lender's spending power goes down because of the loan, the borrower's spending power goes up because of the loan, the two cancel each other out, you can forget about it. Now, I'm going to compare those two visions using a software package I've mentioned they call Minsky, and it's an open source program, so if you click on this link, I hope it'll work, let's see what happens. Nope, didn't go, okay, brought up the program as well. Click on that link, uh, the latest stage, you can come over here and download the copy for free. So it's open source, and it's a modelling tool. And what it lets me do is use that palette you can see behind me, and the table that you can see there as well very vaguely. I'll show you in more detail later and I hope it'll look better on the recording as well. I'm recording the screen here. Of a way of entering equations using a table. So that column, each of those columns is a bank account, obviously, and each row is a transaction between different bank accounts. And if you have a source of flow, like if you're lending money, that's shown as a positive item. And if you're receiving money, that's shown as a negative and all the rows sum to zero. They're making sure the accounting balance is accurate. So there's, for example, there's lending money, shown as minus lend in the recipient, but the liability the bank has goes up, and the sum of the two is zero. And that makes sure you get your accounting right all the way through. Now, you can also model using a very standard paradigm, which is using flowcharts to build mathematical equations. Has anybody here heard of a program called Simulink? Okay, did you do engineering before you did economics? Yeah, part of MATLAB. So I think the commercial price of MATLAB is about 20 grand, isn't it? We're talking serious software here. Engineers use this software to build literally everything engineers now build. It started off in a program like Simulink or this, Sim, and so on. What they do is they let you build a, a flowchart. You can see the little flowchart there. It's rather invisible at the back of the room where most of you are. Typical, typical bunch of ex-university students sit in the back row. Uh, but that then generates an algebraic equation while the Equations up in the top one are building flow equations. So I'm actually building a system of, of differential equations using this program. And you can analyze it, you can simulate, fit it to data, etc., etc. So I'll just show you an example of doing it. Here's loanable funds from my point of view. This is if I was going to put the neoclassical idea of loanable funds into a bank, how would I do it? Well, you'd have the bank having reserves, which and those reserves are whatever the patient agent has deposited there. 
So I've got reserves of $100 in that bank, shown as minus 100 as the liability that the bank owes to the patient agent who's deposited the money there, and there's an inpatient agent with no money at all. And what actually goes on is lending from one agent to another. Of course, when you lend money, you've got to pay interest on it, so there's an interest payment as well, which is the next row, and then you can repay that. Then I've got the inpatient agent actually hiring workers in a factory and then consumption. So that's, that's the whole system there. So that's the source to sink idea of transactions in the model. And that column, what the program does is take that column and build a differential equation, which you can then simulate later. And you've got a whole system of equations coming out of the whole, whole program. So I'm going to build loanable funds step by step. And the first thing is the idea that the patient agent lends to the inpatient agent. And banks just don't really matter. Banks are sitting there. They're the warehouse which we, you know, put stuff in and take stuff out. They're not actually factories in this vision. So that's the model there. I put it together. And, again, it's pretty hard to see from where you are. But let's see if I can actually run it from here. Oh, come on. I've got this new computer. And I don't know. My mouse has disappeared. I've got this, this pointer. But the mouse has disappeared. And it will not let me click. So I can't actually run my damn model. How great that is. I've got it over here. So I might just see if I can... Actually, I'll open a new version of Minsky here. Okay, let's see which one that is. Okay. That's the table. And all I show happening there is that the the patient agent lends to the inpatient agent. The inpatient agent pays interest back to the patient agent and the patient, inpatient agent has to repay the debt. Well, if you run that model, obvious thing happens. The inpatient agent goes broke. Negative balances in the account. Clearly, that's an incomplete model. But that's, that's this basic idea of building a model in the system. So I start from there and say, well, let's actually make it more realistic. Let's imagine what would the inpatient agent do with the money. Now, there's this, this such pejorative language to conventional economic theory. Patient agent sounds like a good person, doesn't he? A good guy. Impatient. Rash, hasty. But if you read outside the neoclassical canon, you get Schumpeter saying the typical borrower in a capitalist economy is the entrepreneur. Slightly more positive term. And they borrow money because they've got a great idea but no money. They need money to put the idea into operation. They borrow it from a bank. And the, the simple thing I bring in here is that you know, on the impatient agent borrows money so that you can hire workers. So I put that together, and I'll bring that over here now. Let's just load that one. I think I've got the whole thing there. Now what I've got... Ah, loaded the wrong with the same one again. Pardon me, just hang on a second. Too many files. Let's try that one. Okay. That looks more like it. Okay, so what I've got the agent doing happening now is as well as lending money, paying interest on it and paying it back, is also hiring workers and workers consume and bankers consume. And you then see what happens with that model and you simulate it and all the money ends up in the impatient agent's bank account but you get the economy growing along quite nicely. Okay. But the point I want to make here is that if I change the parameters of lending quite drastically, the bottom chart there, I'll be going to bring up this so I can just stop that and bring it up in larger scale. Ah. <laughs> Pardon me. This is a great computer, but the pointer is sometimes really hard to land on the, the border you want to actually take a look at. So let's just take a look at these two now. If I now, let's see, move this over a bit. If I drastically change how fast the impatient agent lends, a patient agent lends, or how fast the repayments occur, I make a tiny difference to GDP. Okay. So in the loanable funds world, it's quite true. Big, big changes to how fast thing happens in the banking sector. Forget about it. It doesn't affect the GDP at all. And that's the vision that neoclassical economics uses as an a priori notion to say why you shouldn't bother with the, uh, with the um, banking sector in macroeconomics. 
But what if instead the lending is bank to non-bank, which is the way that post-Keynesian theory says it actually is? If I model that, the only variation I've now got is that the loans occur on the asset side of the ledger. So there was, there's no loans from the banking model from loanable funds because the bank was just a warehouse. But now the bank can produce loans, and when it produces loans, it produces deposits. So if you take a look at the source-to-sink relationship, now it's from assets to liabilities. The loan goes up, it's a positive, it's an asset for the bank. The liability goes up, the positive, the, 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 the positive is a negative, balancing to zero still, but the lending is asset to liability. Whereas if you take a look at it from the point of view of loanable funds, everything's happening on the liability side. There's nothing on the asset side. Now that simple change now gives me a model with a dramatically different effect on how the economy operates. If I just uh, can drag this over, let's uh, load that one. And now if I run this model and I have a change in how fast the bank lends, I get a pretty damn big difference in how fast the economy grows, equally changing the repayment rate. So the financial system and banking is crucial from that point of view. You can't leave it out because you leave out a major source of the growth of demand. So assets are equal to liabilities. I think that little equation, that little graph there I've got, I'm adding all the liabilities up and I'm just meshing, meshing against the loans, which are the only assets in this particular model, and they're identical to each other. So assets equal liability. They have to. But debt does matter because changes in the amount of money in circulation are generated by the growth of debt. And so you have to have a monetary macroeconomics. Now, I could make a theoretical argument like that, but it could be something which empirically didn't wash. You know, it could be as bad as Rogoff and Reinhardt, for example. You all seen that stuff today? You all checked your spreadsheets this morning? <laughs> Check them on the weekend. Um, so let's look through the. Oh, by the way, I, I don't use. Um, hang on, with my water here. I don't use um, Excel. I use MathCAD and paragons like that to do with, with vector base, where I can't make mistakes like they did by leaving out five rows. <clears throat> um, so let's look at this from now from a macroeconomic point of view, using the aggregates we're used to working with. Standard macro tells your aggregate demand is income. Anything you spend becomes somebody else's income. And aggregate supply is just goods and services. You ignore the asset market because they're pre-existing. My approach is to say that aggregate demand is income plus the change in debt. And aggregate supply, I divide as goods and services plus the net turnover on the asset markets. Now, I've been accused of making a new mathematically false argument here. So I've been back through the literature and checked and seen that it's not a new argument. And the people who made it are some pretty good company. I don't mind being told I'm as wrong as Sean Pater, Keynes and Minsky. As far as I'm concerned, if they're wrong, I'm pretty happy to be wrong. And it's not double counting, and I'll show you why in a moment. Minsky attempted to reconcile this way back in 1963, 40 or 50 years ago, and saying, how do you reconcile that there is balance in between sectoral balances when you record income and record demand, they're identical. How can it be true that at the same time debt plays a role? Well, Minsky said if you're looking at a growing economy, then the financial markets, and his focus has always been on a, on a banking sector vision of the economy, have to be generating growing aggregate demand all the time. Sometimes there'll be fallbacks, you know, like the most recent crisis, but generally speaking, growing aggregate demand. He said for that to happen, current spending plans have to be greater than currently received income. So he's saying straight away, notice it's plans, okay? That's really important. But there must be some method that enables that to be reconciled with ultimately when you record it, income being equal to expenditure. He said, therefore, for that to happen, for economic growth to occur, some sectors must be financing some of their spending by debt. So he ties together endogeneity of money, the banking sector, and a growing economy. And he said... This has to happen in a way that doesn't, doesn't cause, what I think loanable funds thinks about, offsetting changes for other sectors. And therefore, once you have that, there must be either an increase in velocity, which can be part of the cause, or creation of new money. Okay? Notice that back in 1963. Now, I can find earlier material from Schumpeter back in 19, the 1920s. So Miski is saying that effective demand to grow while you maintain sectoral balances when you record it later – 
part of effective demand has to be financed by new money, and that's created by the banking sector. And the amount of this rates is not controlled by the Federal Reserve. So you've got a link between the endogenous creation of money and debt by the banking sector and income exceeding demand exceeding income. And put it in mathematical logic, and I've got to thank my colleague Mathias Grosselli, who's the Deputy Director of the Fields Institute, who took me through this maths. I still I'll never forget doing it because Mathias started doing this stuff in his gigantic whiteboard in his room, and I thought this is going to be a waste of time. Boy, was I wrong. Let's start by defining income as wages and profits. All income can ultimately be defined into those two social categories. So you're saying income, output, in, GDP recorded as income, or either wages or profits. And you can divide profits into profits you, retain, you distribute to shareholders and profits you retain. So I can now put distributed plus retained profits inside there. Now expenditure is going to be on goods and services which are going to be the consumer goods or capital goods. I'm leaving out the asset markets at the moment. And there's two sources of demand for the consumer side of that, workers and capitalists. And now I'm saying endogenous money is being created. You can actually have net demand being generated by borrowing money, additional money, for either capitalists or workers. So that's the change in debt for workers that's used to finance additional consumption. And that can be positive or negative. It's negative that bank workers are paying down their consumer debt. And ditto for capitalists, same sort of story. And there's two sources of demand for investment goods. You can do it, invest out of retained earnings or you can have new debt. And there's very good empirical work by all people, Famer and French, to support that. So I can say demand for investment goods will be financed either by retained earnings or the change in the debt of the firm sector for investment. And that can be negative as well. So I put that together. Here's the expenditure equation. And I expand it out to include where the sources of spending come from, rearrange, there's my equation for expenditure, subtract income from that, and what cancels? Okay. Expenditure minus income is equal to the change in debt. Now, it probably still sounds like double counting. It always does. And I'm not just talking neoclassical economists here. Some of my best post-Keynesian friends still accuse me of double counting on this point. It'll take a while to get through. And I think it comes out of this confusion between ex post and ex ante. And Keynes mentioned this way, way back in the 1930s because we still fall into thinking in an ex post sense. Even people who are non-orthodox economists tend to do that. And what we're doing in that case is preparing recorded expenditure with recorded income. But if you're looking at it at the demand level at economy, the capitalist economies are, expenditure precedes, income, expenditure precedes income. You get the, you spend it, the, the spending power includes money in addition to income. Once you spend it, it becomes somebody's income. But it's demand driven, not supply driven. And Keynes was way, way back in the 1930s, talking about this confusion in how the general theory is received. And he said, an investment decision may involve a temporary demand for money before it is carried out. So planned investment needs to get its provision of finance before the investment takes place. And you've got to somehow bridge the gap. And he said you can do it in one of two ways, issue shares or you take on new debt. Now, the idea that there's a, a um, contradiction between this and sectoral balances is wrong because you will find there's a mathematical equality of recorded income and expenditure, even though there's a dip, which is ex post, even though there's a difference ex ante. And that's because when you think of the flow of expenditure out of existing income, we're spending you know, varying amounts of money over time. You could track this fluctuating amount of money being spent out of existing wages and existing profits turning over the money supply that generates those turnovers. But when debt's injected, somebody swipes their credit card and whacks an extra $1,000 into existence by going shopping at Harvey Norman, that sort of thing. So it's a discontinuous injection into a continuous flow. And then it adds to income from that point on once it's been injected. And after that point, the debt has boosted incomes. So the recorded levels, when you record the recorded level of expenditure and recorded income, they will be the same. But you're looking backwards, not looking forwards, as we should be doing as economists. So here's the, the real point. I mean, it's, it's identifying a second source of potential expenditure. You can spend out of income or you can spend out of debt 
and that debt involves an increase in the amount of money in circulation. It's not a transfer from one person to another, but an injection of new spending power into the economy by the banking sector. And Matthias put this little chart together. What you've got going on here is a flow of expenditure out of existing wages and profits over time. And that, at income at time T, will be that point. Then somebody takes out debt with the credit card as the best example to think of, but that's an instantaneous injection. There's a change in debt, and there's expenditure at time T. The gap between the two is the change in debt. Now, when you record them backwards, that's what you record looking backwards. There's expenditure, and there's income. They're equal to each other. And in fact, there's a mathematical theorem that says if you have two continuous functions, which differ only in a series of a finite number of discrete points, their integrals will be identical. So when you're doing the, the summation, doing the national accounting and so on, and getting the result that income equals expenditure, you're just, just, you're just giving an empirical proof of a, of a firm theoretical uh, proposition from mathematics. The easy way to think about it is this way, I think. Expenditure is equal to income before an injection of debt plus the injection of debt. So then you see the two tying together. So sectoral balances, as you record them, is quite consistent with expenditure being greater than income. So that's the theoretical point of view. How does it feed into economic activity? Well, that now means you've got two sources of monetary demand, income plus borrowing, and two categories of supply now, goods and services, but also we borrow money. The largest part of money we borrow these days is to gamble on existing house prices, shares, mainly house prices in this country. So Schumpeter said, well, income is mainly spent on consumption and change in debt is the main source, he thought, of demand for funds for investment. And Minsky said, yes, well, it's investment, but it's also speculation that's financed this way. So if you look at it that way, you can say wages and profits plus the change in debt will be equal to consumption plus investment plus net turnover in the asset markets. And wages and profits go on, on consumption. Profits also go on some investment and some speculation on asset markets. But the change in debt mainly finances investment and speculation on assets. So... I now argue we've got to generalise Volrath law. Volrath law is true in a world in which there are no banks. We don't live in that world, so we need a larger model. And let's say with aggregate demand being, demand being income plus change in debt and aggregate supply, goods and services plus change, turnover in asset markets, this is the generalisation of Volrath law. Now, net as I call that NAT for net asset turnover and break it down into the index for, for assets, the price index, the quantity of assets and how often they turn over on an annual basis. And you get plenty of implications for macroeconomics out of this. First of all, change in debt is going to be a factor in the level of employment and economic activity. There'll be a relationship between those two. And when you take the differential, look at the rate of change, acceleration of debt will play a major role in driving change in asset prices. So those are two implications I can draw from this logic. And you can use this now to explain the great crisis, not just the, the Great Recession, as Americans call it, or the Second Depression, as Europeans are starting to realise that it is for them. You can explain the so-called Great Moderation as well. And also the fact that you've got a relationship between accelerating debt and change in asset prices tells you asset bubbles have to burst, because nothing can accelerate forever, not even the finance sector. Well, let's look at the empirical data now, our way through it. This is the recorded level of private debt in America, which is the red line, GDP, which is the dotted line, and public debt, which is the blue line. Which one are politicians obsessing about? The bottom one. You know, the same brain-dead behaviour here. I find it ridiculous that both sides of politics here are saying the important thing is our blue line, when it's trivial, as you'll see later. But that's I'm now starting off on that data. I now want to analyse it in terms of GDP plus the change in debt. So now I'm taking the GDP store, which is now the black line, but the red line is now the change in private debt on an annualised basis, and the blue line is change in public debt. And the dotted line begin is when the NBER recorded the start of the recession. Now, can anybody see anything about the timing there? This is something that conventional economics can't explain. It's bleeding the obvious when you include change in debt inside there. Now what I'm going to do in the next chart is add those changes in debt to GDP, because I'm saying aggregate demand is income plus the change in debt. Let's see what that tells us. And notice here, by the way, that there are two years 
where the American economy was heavily deleveraging. The private sector was actually reducing its debt level. Now here's the black line being GDP, the red line is GDP plus change in private debt, and the blue line is GDP plus change in both private and public debt. And it's now obvious when the crisis began, it's obvious when it bottomed, and it's obvious when again change in debt turned positive, first of all total debt and then private debt itself is now growing compared to growing once more. So there's some stimulus coming back in the American economy from increasing debt, which is why I think to some extent, the recovery going on in America has legs, so I've got a feeling the uh, Congress will chop those legs off with the sequestration at some point. Now, let's just talk, uh, I'm talking correlations here, by the way, but I've got a causal argument. Unlike Reinhardt and Rogoff, who just worked on correlation without causation, I'm starting from a causal argument. I now want to see if correlations support it. If you look at change in debt and correlate to unemployment in America over the last 43 years, you find the correlation is minus 0.71. Now, bear in mind from neoclassical theory, that correlation should be not significantly different from zero. I've turned the unemployment data upside down so you can see the correlation. It's enormous and it gets stronger as the level of debt compared to GDP grows. So it's profoundly important to know what's going on there. Even if you had an a priori difference with me about this, this is data that should be examined. It's a real sign of how little economists are driven by empirical data that they can just continue dismissing this argument when they have to explain this data. If, they, if, they, if, if the data is there, they should be trying to explain this phenomenon, and they can't. Now, when you look at what happened with public debt, the causation is reversed. I'm now turning unemployment around the usual way, so the unemployment to um, change in private debt relationship looks like a raw shark plot. I'm just using the last uh, 15 years now, roughly, on the correlation since 2000 between change in private debt and the level of unemployment is minus 0.92. But the public debt relationship is plus 0.83. And I think the way you can explain, interpret that is that rising private debt causes falling unemployment. The rising unemployment makes the public sector spend more money. Causation, that's, that's the causal sequence. So you can see the, the red and the blue line are virtually Rorschach plots with each other. The black line roughly follows the red line. So that's the causal mechanism there. Now, I mentioned acceleration, and this is really a big test. I was a bit of a coward here. I was aware of this relationship that if I said change in debt drives employment, then I should find acceleration of debt drives change in unemployment. But I frankly didn't believe the economic data would be good enough to support it, so I didn't actually examine it. Then one day I opened my email tray and found a paper from a guy called Michael Biggs and a couple of other economists in the private sector, and they'd done it. They took what they call the credit, they call it credit impulse, I've called it the credit accelerator, and they looked at the relationship, and it was powerful. This is a second-order differential to a first differential, roughly speaking, in economic data, and the correlation over that 20-year uh, period is minus 0.74 to an acceleration of debt and change in unemployment, which, again, is phenomenally strong. Now... So all this stuff is important in explaining economic performance, but it also lets us explain historically different periods. Obviously, this hasn't been the Great Depression number two for America. I think it is a worse Great Depression for Europe than the Great Depression was, frankly. But for America, not so bad. Why might that be? Well, the red line there, the red lines are the situation in the 1930s. The blue line is today. And I've taken the beginning of each chart from the point before the crisis when the change in debt made its biggest contribution to aggregate demand. Now, back in the Great Depression, of the Roaring Twenties, the Great Gatsby comes out in, what, about 10 days' time in Australia about the excesses of the 1920s. You guys lived through something that make that look like child's play, okay? Because the maximum debt stimulus back in the Great Depression was about 8% of GDP. Oh, the Roaring Twenties was about... 8% of GDP, as you can see from where the red line starts on the on the y-axis. But for us, it started in America at 22% of GDP. That's how much debt finance was driving the economy. And government spending to bomb the hell out of Iraq and things like that added another 3%. Then you see the severity of the, of the very gradual plunge for the Great Depression starting in, in 1928. But you then had this enormous long period of deleveraging where the private sector was spending less than it earned, so paying debt down, from pretty much 1930 
right up to 1937. Oh, no, sorry, no, 1930, 1935, pardon me. And then the government rescue was the gap between those two red lines. Now, you can see how slow the government was to respond. By, by the year two on that chart, we're talking 1930. Year three is 1931, year four is 32, and so on. And you can see there's a bit of big spending in about 31, but then it fell back a bit. The New Deal is that bit there. That's the scale of the New Deal. Now, this is the scale of Obama's stimulus. This is the fiscal stimulus, not looking just not looking at what the Federal Reserve was doing, everybody focuses upon. The scale of the fiscal stimulus was much, much bigger, and you can see how much faster it was. The fiscal, the fiscal stimulus from the government this time round came less than two years, just slightly more than two years after the peak of the debt finance boom. Very, very fast response. Whereas for the Great Depression, it took six years before the new after the peak of debt finance contribution, five years after four years after the start of the crisis, before government spending dived in. So I think probably the best argument against austerity is saying, why is this period better than the Great Depression? That's really the reason why. Faster, far bigger stimulus. Notice what happens further on, by the way. Back in about 36, 30, 35, 36, the focus of government policy shifted to believing the crisis was over, we've got to reduce government debt. Unemployment had fallen from 25% to 11%. And then they started cutting back the government stimulus. You can see how the gap between the two red lines narrows. That's a reduction, still a deficit, but it's a smaller deficit. Notice the private sector goes below that dotted line there, nine years on from, so we're talking 1937. The private sector started to deliver again under the pressure of the government sector cutting money out of the economy and therefore less turnover for businesses and so on. So you fell back into another depression. Unemployment rose from 11% to 20% as a result of that. And what got them out of it? The Second World War. And we're likely to repeat the same mistake by focusing on public debt and thinking that's the problem. Now, of course, Australia is different. We know it didn't happen here. Anybody here written a paper talking about the North Atlantic financial crisis? I read a few of those out of Canberra. Let's take a look at Australia. This is the same idea of looking at private debt, GDP, and government debt. Now, looking at that, who the hell's going to worry about the blue line compared to the American situation? I've embedded the American chart just to give you a bit of a comparison there. You know, even if public debt was a worry, it's not a worry here. Then let's look at GDP and the change in debt. Now, again, same sort of story. To begin, there is the American downturn. We didn't actually have one, remember? Um, notice that we had the same phenomenon. Change in private debt tried to climb drastically from that point, but it didn't go negative. It didn't fall below the dotted line. It shows zero on that chart. Public debt rose a bit, but in, in much. I didn't expect this again, by the way. This is a surprise to me. I thought the right stimulus was bigger than the American stimulus. It looks like it wasn't bigger compared to the level of government debt at the time, but not on the same scale as the American spending. That's the American one again. Again, you'll be able to see, I'll, I'll give you a copy of these, of course, to have a look at later, but you'll see the comparison there. Now let's look at the aggregate demand being GDP plus change in debt. And what you can see is we bounced. We never quite went negative. There was no deleveraging in Australia. And again, that could have been how fast our government responded, not with fiscal packages on the same scale as America, but we, of course, invented the first-time vendors boost. And that was worth about $100 billion on my calculations as an injection into the economy. There's the American again. Okay. Very, very different pattern. Now looking at what's about the change in private debt and unemployment. It's a lower correlation than America, but it's still minus 0.6 when, according to conventional theory, it should be close to zero. Insignificant. There's the American data, again, for a comparison. That's from 1980 to now, so I'm talking over 30 to 33 years. Funny thing is it is different in public debt because when you look at the rising private debt causes falling unemployment, that's correct, same sort of correlation. This is over a shorter time period now. But rising unemployment does not cause rising public debt. It's actually a positive correlation between them. The small, very small 
negative correlation, pardon me, until the financial crisis hit. Then we started behaving like the rest of the world. So you can still see the sort of Rorschach plot between unemployment and change in private debt, but public debt doesn't play the same role until right at the end. So again, that comparison with the American data there. But the interesting thing is the acceleration relationship is actually stronger. That's showing the acceleration in debt and the change in unemployment. So a slightly stronger negative correlation than the American data. Again, for comparison, that's there. So we are the same qualitatively. We just had different quantitative levels of change, different starting points, therefore we didn't experience the same crisis, but the same basic logic applies even between you know, an American economy which suffered in the crisis and one which we think managed to miss out on it. And here's a look at the debt finance demand issue as well. That's looking at the just a, you know, the, red, the red line is Australia, the blue line is the USA. And again, even though we think we had a huge stimulus here, it doesn't compare to the scale of government stimulus spending in America. <coughs> but now, notice our total level of stimulus spending from the government sector, like government plus private, is less than the American. Okay? And we're talking about reducing it. I think it qualifies as dumb. Well, I'm going to go something more intelligent, and that's Minsky. Has anybody here read Minsky at all? Beauty. Anybody else? Okay. I'll give you a very fast summary of Minsky. <coughs> And this is the verbal model. Kaminsky ever never, never built a mathematical one. He tried, didn't get there. He said, you have to take an economy in historical time. And because you're talking in historical time, not just logical but historical time, there's some point in the past where there's been a debt-induced crisis. Well, let's take an economy just after that crisis when it's recovered moderately. <coughs> Pardon me. But firms and banks still remember the crisis, so they're both very conservative about, about putting forward projects and getting debt finance. And therefore, only conservative projects actually get funding. But because the economy is recovered, most of those projects succeed. And the response of both firms and banks is to think, hey, if we'd been more levered, we would have made more money. So the accepted ratio of debt to equity starts to rise. You start to value assets more highly. And Minsky's classic phrase, stability is destabilising. A period of tranquil, <coughs> tranquil economic performance causes rising expectations, <coughs> a bit of irritation in my throat, pardon me, and for a while that's good because you have more investment taking place and that makes the economy grow more rapidly. But you also have rising expectations leading to what Minsky calls the euphoric economy. <coughs> pardon me. Does anybody, um, oh, I, I get an irritation in my throat sometimes when talking and I'd soda water would help, but it's, I'll, I'll see if I can survive. People listening to this on the internet is going to get very sore ears hearing me cough. Okay. Minsky talks about what he calls the euphoric economy, where people are so sure the projects are going to succeed that it's happy days are here again. Think the 2000 bubble, you know, the dot-coms and all that sort of jazz. You get speculation on asset prices. The money supply is expanded as well, which drives up asset prices as well. Riskier investments are taking place, and Ponzi financiers come out of the woodwork. And they're people who've got a cash flow which is less than their debt servicing costs, a bit like Alan Bond. You know, Alan Bond went broke selling beer to Queenslanders. How do you do that? You borrow too much money to buy the brewery. But he could have got, got away with it if he sold Forex to somebody else for a higher price. Didn't manage to do it, so he goes bankrupt. And ultimately, you get rising levels of debt, many, many unsuccessful projects being funded, accumulated losses, the bubble bursts, People may try to sell their assets to get liquidity and the asset market collapses. It's nowhere near as liquid as we think. And the very first ones to fail are the Ponzi financiers. They used to be seen as the financial geniuses. Asset prices go backwards and you're back in a crisis again. So that's the basic logic. And you think about the history, historical pattern. That's what we've been doing for the last 30 years. Okay. So... Then when you get in that situation, the money supply goes into reverse. That drives you backwards as well. Investment evaporates you back where you started once more. And what will happen over time is the tendency for those debt levels to ratchet up to a higher level. And you'll get to a final crisis where the debt is so big that the economy can't service the debt anymore and you go into permanent collapse. And that's where I believe we arrived back in 2007. That's why I went public in 2005. Because looking at the data, I thought this has got to be the big one. That's why I stuck my neck out publicly about it. Now, my work has been in modelling Minsky. 
No, no, most of you would have been trained in New Keynesian economics. So I want to go through the differences in the way that I approach modelling. First of all, it's monetary versus non-monetary. I've covered that. And it's dynamic and cyclical. I don't take equilibrium for granted. I don't use micro foundations. And the reason is good microeconomic research says you shouldn't. This is a quote, a quote from uh, a paper called uh, uh, Excess Demand Functions by Sonnenschein. And he says that when you look at the logic, can you derive the law of demand for a market working from a individuals will obey the law of demand? The answer is no. Okay. A market demand curve is a squiggly line. Any polynomial can be a market demand curve, let alone at the aggregate level of the overall economy. So there's no justification for micro foundations in macroeconomics. And the best person for this was a guy called Alan Kerman, who actually argued effectively in favour of the classical school working in terms of social classes. I've given all the references here later on in the, in the talk. So he said we should abandon working from the isolated individual and work at socially cohesive groups instead, which is pretty much saying work with social classes. I also use a linear production technology. I don't have diminishing returns, and you can find reasons for that in Schrafa. But Alan Blinder also confirmed that empirically back in 1998 by accident. He wasn't trying to confirm it. But he did a survey which covered about 8% of America's manufacturing sector. And he said the overwhelmingly bad news for economic theory is that only about 11% of GDP appeared to be produced under conditions of rising marginal cost. Very different to the textbook vision of economics. And I don't use a Cobb Douglas production function. Now, the main reason for that is that if you look at the Cobb Douglas production function with constant uh, elasticity, it's simply a nonlinear mapping of y equals w plus pi, wages, income equals wages plus profits, when you have fairly constant income shares. I could take you through the mathematical logic of that. There's a wonderful paper by Anwar Sheikh titled The Humbug Production Function, where he draws the word humbug on a graph and then fits it, with it to a Cobb-Douglas production function, very accurately. <laughs> Beautiful paper. Anwar and I fight like cat and dog over Marx, but I think it was a magnificent piece of work. And it's valid, however, when you include energy, which, of course, it does not get paid in income. And this is work being done by Bob Ayers and quite a few others. I'm working with them in ecological economics these days. So when it's generalised to include energy and seeing free energy as the source of capacity to produce a surplus, then it can be valid, but not beforehand. Now, the basic model I use come from Richard Goodwin. Anybody heard of the name Goodwin before? Another name worth researching. Richard wrote very poorly, in my opinion. The person to read, if you want to understand him, is, is, is John Blatt, who's an Australian and deceased Australian economist. So his growth cycle model is what I call the structural, virtually assumption-free model, because it starts saying capital determines the level of output, roughly speaking. So you use an accelerator relationship for that. Output determines employment, given labour productivity. The number of workers hired determines the employment rate, given population. That determines the rate of change of wages, the Phillips curve type argument. Integrate the, the, the wages, you then get the wage level. Multiply that by labour, you get the wage bill. Subtract that from output, you've got profits. And in Goodwin's simple model, all profits are invested. So you integrate the rate of change with capital stock or you integrate, integrate investment, you get back to capital again. So it's a cyclical, it's a causal model. And when you simulate it, pardon me, it gives you cycles, not equilibrium. The equilibrium smack dab in the middle there, and it's neutral, neither an attractor nor a repeller. So I took that as my basic model, and that's showing it in Minsky. Now, again, I'll have to bring it up and show it to you. Okay, I'll just open with the other version over here. That's the basic model, and if I simulate it, I get cycles in the worker's share of output and level of employment. And you plot the two against each other, you get a closed cycle. It'll go on indefinitely between the two. Okay. So that's the basic non-linear non cyclical model, not because I've assumed non-linearity. There is no non-linearity in the, in the assumption of the model. Non-linearity turns up, I'll just actually stop that. Non-linearity turns up because of inherent non-linearities. Because output, oh, sorry, sorry, there should be wages, pardon me. The wage bill is wages, which is a variable, 
multiplied by employment, which is also a variable. So multiply the two together, that gives you the wage bill. So it's an inherent nonlinearity. You can't get away from it unless you assume wages are constant, which is what we do in neoclassical economics. Drop the assumption. So having done that, uh, I now say, well, part of the part of the simplicity of the model of the, that Goodwin used was to say that investment profits are all the profits are invested. That's not true. Okay? But a simple first step, I'm going to have assumed that there's a linear relationship between the level of investment and the level of the rate of profit. And so firms will borrow money to finance investment when it exceeds profits. And if I do that, I've now got down the bottom here, I'll just actually pan over a bit and zoom in and show you that bit. What I have here is, here's the nonlinear relationship for investment. Let's make it a bit larger. That's saying there's some level of profits at which capitalists are happy with their level of return, so they don't invest. Anything above that, they invest more than profits. I then multiply that by the level of output to get the level of investment being undertaken. And if investment's greater than profits, then that changes the level of debt. And you then have to pay interest on that debt, which you then come back over here, and you subtract the interest payments from, uh, from output plus wages or minus wages to get you the right level of profit in the first place. So it's a causal cycle. Now, if I simulate that, you'll see the cycle is no longer closed. This, um, you'll see the, the one to the right-hand side there is no longer a closed loop. And I'll let that run for a while. Now, it looks like, notice it's gone inside. Okay, it looks like you're heading towards equilibrium now. And this is one of the great dangers of focusing just on wages, share or inflation and employment because you look at those two together, and that's the left-hand uh, left -hand graph, the well, left hand, the far left-hand and the, the, the third graph across, they're both having smaller and smaller cycles. It looks like the great moderation. Everything's going to be fine. Notice how this little loop's going down the bottom there, though. I'll come over and show you where that gets to in a while. It'll take a while to get there. That's what ultimately happens. You have a period of diminishing cyclical behaviour, which makes you think everything's really going great, and then all hell breaks loose. Now, I've done this as a linear model because I wanted to be as free of assumptions as possible and just show that it's not because I assume some exponential relationship for wages setting or for investment that I get cycles and breakdown. It's simply out of the structure of the model. And it goes, mathematically what it's doing is, is following what's called the inverse tangent route to chaos. And I can explain that in questions later. So I bring in nonlinear equations later for realism because with a linear equation I'm saying a profit is low, capitalists destroy factories. Okay? They don't. So the nonlinearity just stops you having an unrealistic assumption inside there. It doesn't actually, isn't reasonably generate the cycles. So when I bring in a nonlinear model with, where I have nonlinear functions for wages share, wages determination and uh, investment, that's the sort of behaviour I get. And you can see that sinkhole effect going on there. That's what happens. You have a period of apparent rising, diminishing cycles and then breakdown, which is what we went through. We went through a period of diminishing cycles and then breakdown. So what's going on there? Well, when you mathematically examine the properties of that model, you find it has two non-trivial equilibria. And my colleague Matthias and his PhD student uh, Costa Lima describe one as a good equilibrium, positive wages share, positive employment and finite debt. But there's also a bad one with zero wages share, zero employment and infinite debt. Now clearly I'm not taking account of bankruptcy and things like that inside this model. And they're both locally stable for some parameter values. Now, this, the, you would like to be around the good one for obvious reasons. But the higher the rate of interest and the higher the initial level of debt, the smaller the basin of attraction is for that spot. And you can pass from the good equilibrium to the bad equilibrium region, a bit like going across the event horizon of a black hole. And if you don't know you've done it until after you've done it, then it's too late, which is what we pretty much did back in the 2000 period. So the policy question is, how do you destabilise the bad equilibrium? How do you drive yourself away from that if you've actually got there? And Minsky's argument was that big government does it. The basic logic being that big government, welfare payments and tax 
uh, tax receipts prevent you collapsing into a black hole because they give firms a cash flow they wouldn't otherwise have during a downturn. That's fundamentally seen the purpose of government spending. You can spend it on pink bats that can be a farce, but you put money into the economy that the people producing those lousy pink bats and short-circuiting houses and so on spend at Woolworths. Okay, and that cash flow keeps the economy ticking over. So I model that in Minsky by having a government sector whose spending rises when unemployment exceeds some fixed target and falls when it's below that target. But it doesn't waver, unlike the actual governments that have gone from defining full employment as 1% unemployment to full employment as 5.5% unemployment. This is if a government actually stuck the line. If you simulate that, you get complex cycle. I'll go back and show you where that particular Minsky model is getting to. That's the linear one there. You can see the cycles getting larger and larger there. Let's just stop that one, and I'll now load the government model. And this is now a government sector. Actually, I'll just put that chart up on, hang on just pause that for a second. That's the plot I'm going to show you there is of wages share of output, which is a proxy for inflation, uh, versus the uh, employment rate. I'll let that run in the background for a while now. That's the sort of behaviour you get. Complex cycles. Again, you can load, load all in. These, are, these uh, examples are all embedded into the presentation, by the way. So you get cycles. You don't get an avoidance of cyclical behaviour. But the cycles mean the economy doesn't break down. And that's the essential thing you want to avoid. You want to avoid falling into that black hole. So Minsky's argument about government spending doing that is supported by the model and I think supported by the comparative experience of Europe versus America. Now, all that stuff that I've shown you so far, I'm getting close to the presentation, by the way. I hope you've survived the amount of info I'm throwing at you here. Uh, those are all implicitly monetary models because I had investment in excessive retained earnings, meaning you needed to borrow money, and then the loans create deposits, meaning that the extra money being created was identical to the debt, so I sort of let the money fall into the background there. But I've always wanted to include the monetary system explicitly, and I wanted also to get price dynamics because part, obviously deflation is a major part of the experience of debt deflation, so I couldn't do that without explicit money. But I'm now able to do that, and this is actually a little bonus for this, well, my talk here. I hope it's a bonus for you as well. I hadn't actually done this in double-entry bookkeeping terms before yesterday, and I thought, if I'm going to show this to you, I better try to convert the single-entry version I have done and published in a couple of academic papers into double-entry bookkeeping, so it's all quite consistent, and I've done that. So I've now got this, the same model I've shown you, the cyclical growth model there, with a banking sector, explicitly having money being created by the whole dynamic and having a generalised version of Phillips's arguments about what determines rate of change of wages as well. So it's not just the rate of money, money wage change depending upon the rate of employment, it's also the rate of change of the employment rate and the rate of inflation. So I've got, you know, workers getting compensated for inflation inside here as well. I give a bit of background here to Phillips. I'll let you read that at your leisure. I'm going to go through it very quickly here because of time. So I have nonlinear functions for the Phillips curve, for investment as a function of the rate of profit, and for repayment of debt as a function of the rate of profit. And the price, the pricing equation, much to my amazement, neoclassical pricing models are completely consistent with post-Keynesian ones when you work in a monetary sense. One collapses into the other. But in a dynamic sense, I've got prices being a lag convergence of the flow of demand, which is monetary, to the flow of supply, which is physical output times prices, and prices working to try to equilibrate that, but it doesn't, which you'll see, give you equilibrium. But if you run it first of all, that's how the model first went, and when I first simulated this yesterday, I thought, oh, well, I've found an equilibrium outcome, I'll have to work a bit harder to find parameters that give a breakdown. Then I got distracted by some news item on the Sydney Morning Herald website, and I came back and I saw this. The breakdown applies. I'll show you. That's now the model, the government model, with the still running away at the moment. Let's just, uh, actually, I'll let that continue. Let's add another version of Minsky. I'll now open the prices model. And here again, the importance here is if you leave out debt out of your thinking, then you can think everything's going along swimmingly with the economy. Oh, bloody hell, what's happened here? I've stuffed up something, obviously. Let's see. Ah, 
now let's see if it works. Yep, great. So the model will look like it's approaching equilibrium. You can see the cycles over here in this chart of uh, employment versus uh, wages share of output. And over here you've got an inflation rate on the profit rate. Inflation is falling from very high levels, a period of diminishing cycles. Everything's looking great with the world. You guys can take the credit here, or this, this Reserve Bank can, you know, controlling inflation and unemployment, pat themselves on the back. Look over here. This is the debt-to-GDP ratio. Series of cycles where the cycles are getting slightly higher each time. Now that I don't have bankruptcy in the model, so once you get in debt and you're paying interest on it, the debt continues to compound. Cycles diminish. You might think that's getting under control as well. And watch what happens over here. And here. You're now in deflation. Persistent deflation. And the economy is falling into that black hole. Good night, Josephine, to the economy. Now, I think stylistically, that's what we've been through. That's the crisis we've experienced. So takeaway points from all of this. First of all, Keynes was right that a monetary economy is fundamentally different to a VADA one, which is what we really model in macro models today. But you must incorporate banks, debt and money explicitly. You can't leave them out of the system. You will not explain the model completely unless you include them. And what I've shown you with Minsky is that it's actually easy to do that. That model took me about six hours to build yesterday, including coffee breaks. And both the boom and the bust we've been through were caused by a private debt bubble. The focus upon government debt is the wrong focus. So we're going to get out of this crisis. We have to reduce private debt, not public debt. Reducing that, as we're seeing in Europe, actually makes the crisis worse. The government debt's actually a stabilising factor. And you can model the economy as a monetary system. We don't have to ignore bank debt and money anymore. It's actually quite easy to do. And I'd like to see treasuries and central banks and maybe even universities doing it. And if the Treasurer wanted to get involved with me on this one, I'd be delighted. So just a final little thing. How long is this likely to be the, the, the environment? How long is the crisis going to go on? That comes down to the level of debt we're in. And this is looking at America's private and public debt over the last 90 years. And you can see the Great Depression peaked at a debt level of 240% of GDP with the entire rise from 1930 to 1932 being driven by deflation. We began at 303% of GDP. It's now down to 250%. It's still above the peak level of debt of the Great Depression. It is now rising once more. So we might actually see another bubble in the economy going up. But we're not going to get out of the crisis until debt levels are back down about the level they were back in the 1960s, where all the debt that existed back then, you can pretty much say, was used for productive purposes or for necessary consumption. So I think we've got a long, long way to go before we're out of the woods of this particular financial crisis. And I've got a mass of references there for future reading. Thanks very much. Oh, yeah. Um, you said that your model didn't have a micro foundation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit more detail about the terms that you use in your model? How do they make sense? They say what optimization is. No, no optimization. It's, again, optimization implies a known system. If I wanted to work out you know, which point in the policy oscar I can stand on, uh, there's an easy point to work out where the curvature is right. And I can work out where the differential is zero. That's an optimization, that's where it applies. In economics, we're talking about the future. It's uncertain. So what people do is they're rational, but they work on what matters to them and they extrapolate that forward. Keynes gave a beautiful set of reasons or ideas about how people actually set their expectations. And he said, we, we have to make decisions about the future, but we don't know anything about it. So what we tend to do is we do, one, we do three things. We have a set of conventions. We take the, the, the recent past as, an, fairly, as an accurate guide to the future even though we know if we look back that wouldn't that's never been true. So we extrapolate current conditions forward. That's not, I, I think it's a bad word. Of, I'd be careful about calling I call it. I call it rational response under uncertainty. That's what I call not optimization. That really does imply you know, getting a differential right. So what I have in the model, I have uh, firms decide how much to invest given the current rate of profit. So what they're effectively doing is saying we can extrapolate this rate of profit forward.
And if you look at the mining sector in Australia, that's what it clearly did. You know, huge investments because look at the profits we're making right now on the price level. So based it on what, what you do is base each um, social group's decision making on the variable that matters to them in the complex system we call the economy. So firms, generally speaking, are going to look at the rate of profit, rate of growth of their prices compared to other firms, those sorts of things, and then extrapolate from that. Workers will look mainly at the rate of employment, change in the rate of the rate of employment, the inflation rate, those sorts of things. So that's what's going on in the model. But because we have a complex model where you can't actually know its overall dynamics, you behave rationally with information you know, but it's not meta-rationality where you know what the system will do if you do something. If you look at how neoclassical theory defines rational behaviour, it has people doing what's rational for the system when you really can't know the whole system. You know your bit of it. So it's I, I, I'm quibbling with you, I know, but I think I call it rational behaviour under uncertainty rather than optimization. Yeah. Two questions. That's when you were talking about financial instability, that yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The second you were talking about Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, I guess, about the situation how to say you need to know what you guys have done. And what you said, some of the business versus consumer debt, so I'm not sure if you want to do that. Yeah. Um, I'm often, Austrians try to co-opt me all the time. And um, Schumpeter's advisor was, was Schumpeter, oh, sorry, Minsky's advisor was Schumpeter. So there's a lot of influence in the Austrian background and in, in how Sh Minsky thought. And focusing upon disequilibrium is an essential part of the Austrian vision. So I think there's those levels of overlap and also subjective um, experience-based setting of prices. But I apply that to financial assets, not to ordinary commodities. So my starting point is an, is an objective theory of value, but I call it dialectical objectivism, which I'll explain over a beer one day, if you like. But uh, not, not the Austrian, which is starting the totally from subjective theory of value. So I differ at that level. And they also, if you look at the semi vexelian sort of idea about a natural rate of interest. And if you go a low, break, break below that, you'll cause speculation above it, you'll get... Uh, I think that's wrong. I wouldn't see there being a natural rate. I see it as being unanchored and effect, based on expectations and profit to some extent. <clears throat> Pardon my voice breaking. I feel like I'm turning to a teenager again, if only. Um, so those are differences there, but certainly the focus upon disequilibrium is essential. Where I differ from the Austrians as well, they argue you can't model macroeconomy mathematically. Clearly I'm doing that. And I think that's partially um, a reaction to the equilibrium modelling they were seeing economists do at their own time. If you look at what's done in chaos theory and complexity, then you are modelling a complex system. You get dynamics which you simply can't predict into the future. You get a non-ergodic deterministic system. So there are lots of reactions to them which say that stuff's well, what Paul Davidson calls ergodic. Um, equilibrium, blah, 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 we don't want to have that. I think modern Austrians should come on board the capacity to model the system using nonlinear dynamics and complexity theory. So some of these are the differences. In terms of how the debt's being used right now, I've got my, my, one of my closest colleagues is Michael Hudson, who uh, coined a beautiful phrase about the... Um, level of debt saying debts that won't be repaid can't be repaid. Is that if we've got to be, if we'll go through debt abolition, a large part of those debts that can't be repaid were accumulated in speculation. And Michael talks about the fire economy, finance, investment and real finance, insurance and real estate. That's actually a division in the NIPA tables. I've forgotten the person who put the NIPA tables together right now, but they actually called the fire sector. So if you look at the fire sector that's where the speculation is going on, finance and real estate, clearly. Um, that sector got far too large. At one stage, that was making half the profits of the American economy. One of my students put a beautiful question to me once, saying, is the finance sector a profit center or a cost center to be minimized? It's the latter. Okay. It's a cost of business. Whoever let the cost of business, if, if finance, expand dramatically. So the debt that's been created that's financed the dot-com bubble, that was partially creative. You needed some of that debt to generate the huge investment in telecommunications and internet and so on. But the whole stuff into the real estate was a waste of money. It's a, a bubble that caused a debt bubble that caused a house price bubble and, and then collapsed. 
So I'd, I'd say that in the American economy, something like about one and a half years worth of GDP is unproductive debt. And the remainder, you can say, might be productive debt, which we use for firms for investment purposes, entrepreneurial behaviour, and necessary debt finance for consumers. Another, if I can elaborate a bit on your question, when you disaggregate the level of debt by sector over the last 80, 90 years, look back at the Great Depression, the level of non-financial business debt was 125% of GDP at the start of the Great Depression. The remainder, which is household debt and finance sector, just added another 50% of GDP. So total debt level started roughly 175%, but the vast majority owed by real businesses. And when the crisis hit, they were the ones in debt. They had to get service their debts straight away. Competitive response, which is to come back to this idea of rationality versus optimization here, cut your prices, get the customers in through your door rather than your competitor's door. But you all do it. So I think the massive deflation back in the Great Depression was largely because of that sectoral break up at the level of debt. Now, if you look at the American economy today, a far higher level of aggregate debt, peaking, as I said, at over 300% of GDP, only 70% of that, roughly, was business debt. 120% was the finance sector, the remainder was household. So what you've now got in the finance sector has drastically paid its debt down, but still about the 100% of GDP level. The household sector has reduced its debt as well, but how does it reduce its debt? By not going shopping. Okay. So the, the big difference between the business sector being in debt and the households are threefold. First of all, if you're business, you can get out of debt by three ways. One, you can go bankrupt. Now, I've never yet seen a company that's embarrassed about being bankrupt. It doesn't exist anymore. Okay. You can stop investing and you can sack the workers. Okay. Look at households. Going bankrupt is really embarrassing because you're still alive after you've gone bankrupt. Okay. It's pretty hard to stop consumption and you can't sack the kids. Okay. So there's these reasons why it's much, much harder to get out of this crisis, even though the severity of the downturn was much more severe back in the Great Depression. Yeah? Um, what's the uh, close on the government sector? Like? How does it raise it? Yeah, um, I've still got to build that properly. What I'm showing you, that's that simple model. The, uh, the government sector model simply has a government generating the debt. So effectively what's going on, if you like I've got a captive reserve bank, they're required to give the government the finance they need. What I've done with Minsky, what I, what I hope to do, that's by the way the uh, we've got models are not running anymore. Let's bring up another one here. What you can do in the sector now is create multiple banks. And you can say make one of them the central bank. Or make, say, one the Treasury. Good one, of course. Okay. Now we've got ourselves a Treasury. And we have a central bank over here. Is a, it's always beta software. You always get little bugs turning up there. And let's call this, uh, I'll call this, P, I'll call this, um, say, Cap Bank. Well, let's call it Macquarie Bank. We all know it's a capitalist bank here. Okay. Okay. Ah, didn't happen. I have to show these error messages to Russell, my programmer, when I get back to Sydney. And this one might be, let's say, uh, let's call it ANZ. So I've now got a multiple bank system and I can actually build those dynamics between the systems. So the ambition is to be able to say if the government runs a deficit, then it has to sell bonds to bond, buy, bond, you know, bond purchases who then the central bank can then buy the bonds off them, et cetera, et cetera. I've done all the logic for that uh, in just getting mathematical equations out of it. Just to show you that too, by the way, I haven't shown you this. I guess my point is at some point, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, this, this, yeah. Yeah, I mean, kind of Rogoff and Ryan had done me a great favour two days ago by having their data exposed to show that their case against that was fairly weak. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, there's there's a group there's a group of non orthodox economists called modern monetary theory who argue that the government effectively they, they conflate the government and the treasury there's the treasury and the central bank and say that if the government needs to service its deficit then the central bank prints the money. And they say you don't need to worry about any level at all. I'm not completely in that camp, but it is a certain argument that if the private sector person goes gets financial financial difficulty, they can't print their own dollars, whereas the government can. So there's less reason to panic about the level of government debt than private debt. That's why I think I want to change the focus. But I still think it's true about having to manage how far that debt gets to be. And if you take a look at the historical data on that front, let's just go back to um, that slide. You can see that America's had far bigger levels of private public debt during the post-war period than they had than they have today, and that got reduced largely by inflation. Okay. Over time, it was, wasn't just a case of paying it down by having to service the debt. You also, because debt's nominal, the economy is growing, you've got positive inflation, the debt burden gets reduced by inflation over time. So even with the level of the stimulus now, we're still back at about 90% of GDP, which is roughly where the American government was in 1950, not during the Second World War, but in the aftermath of the Second World War. But I take the point, you have to consider those issues as well, which is why I built a system that enables us to model multiple banks and put this all together. And I'm actually arguing that you can't just do it by government stimulus. I think we actually have to abolish some of the debt, some of the private debt directly, rather than rely on just upon government spending. Well, you can all just uh, thank Stephen for a uh, very enlightening presentation. And, uh, I'm sure you'll uh, provide me with yep. the slides and I'll uh, just give you, you know, it, it has been recorded so long that I'm going to send it. But so if anybody's got any follow up questions, I'm happy to uh, ask Stephen. Buy me a drink so I stop croaking as well. Okay, sure. Thank you.